Every day they used to be business, sitting there for magic potion. It's right, me friend, stealing his one. Now, and uh, I'd like to say a big hello to everybody out there, People's Internet Radio at uh, www.peoplesinternetradio.com uh, I'd like to take a, a quick moment just to say uh, hello to everybody with the... Uh, <laughs> after all that... Uh, um, just uh, to remind everybody about the donate button and uh, that's all I'll say about that and uh, a big hello to everyone in the chat box I'll, I'll get in there in just a second I'm just trying to get tightened up here uh, How you doing Sean again? And here, here we go, week 27 Week 27, yeah, we've certainly been stacking them up uh, we've got a slightly uh, quieter week this week for the uh, European news. Uh, we've uh, just got one, uh, because of the, the uh, anniversary of Nagasaki and Hiroshima is on, uh, because there's loads of things going on uh, that the nuclear industry would rather us not know about, um, we've basically done a, a, a sort of a, an interview or a discussion with Hervé Courtois, who's... Uh, basically used to go under the handle of Dun Renard um, and he's an admin on many book, uh, pages, Facebook pages, uh, mainly to do with nuclear uh, but he does have a wider interest um, uh, but, but so obviously we're getting a talk about the issues in, in Fukushima today and, and it's very appropriate uh, how we tie up uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki and Fukushima um, in many respects. We, we look at both those situations and, and try to tie them together um, and obviously Herve brings us some great update information. Uh, he's been doing a lot of research in this area. He, he's, uh, he's definitely uh, worth checking that, uh, that interview out if you really do want to get updated on uh, the uh, situation in Japan and how the uh, sort of powers that be, if you like, uh, have basically manipulated the data uh, and uh, sort of given the impression to everyone that everything is A-OK. -okay. So um, uh, with that, I suppose, uh, Jimmy, I mean, did you want to start off with some European news or should we talk about our, um, our interesting little uh, issues with these social media uh, information companies? Well, I suppose it's not like it's a huge issue just at the minute, but I do find it quite interesting how we do seem to be getting the attention of uh, one particular company, I might say, and uh, <laughs> we were we were sitting around there. We, oh, we, we've been waiting for months and months and months to get a click off Google or somewhere like that, and, that, and then out of the blue, we get uh, a click from uh, Aranda, Aranda. Is it Aranda Solutions? Aranda. Solutions, Aranda yeah. Solutions, you know, and uh, so we, we were we were fairly scratching our head about that one for a little while because when we clicked on the link, we couldn't uh, we we got through to an error page, and uh, so but it turned what if did, did this Aranda Solutions now they are a data warehousing company as far as I can gather, and uh, what they're doing is they're gathering data so that uh, to share with corporations so that they can improve their uh, PR skills, would that be correct? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's basically to, to troll the internet and they f look for information that may affect their customers and their customers would be uh, corporations uh, and uh, in this case there'd be ones in Nova Scotia and uh, more importantly there'd be ones to do with the tar sands and of course we had Candice Paul on, uh, we had a lot of hacking going on um, and there has, has certainly been other it's been quite interesting. I've noticed that other people who've been posting First Nation stories, uh, which we commented on last week uh, with Brenda Norrell, um, and we, we've also seen other uh, Facebook people that post a lot, um, have been having problems accessing their Facebook again. Now, the problem, that I, the, the, the possibility that the connection between Orenda Solutions um, and the way that we're, a lot of activists are being blocked 
uh, is unsure. Arenda may only just be part of the uh, part of the equation. But uh, they got kind of cut, uh, caught out, really, because we just started uh, uh, a WordPress site. And we've just been migrating over there because it's just easier use, use, format to use. Um, and we're basically uh, seeing uh, this uh, click coming in from this Arenda Solutions. Now, it sounds like it may have been a partially an automated process, but they have come in twice. Uh, and they've come in twice in the last uh, week or so. Hmm. Here's a little bit of a here's a little bit of a, a, a taster on what this said. Uh, this is just a, a little caption from their front page, right? Orenda is an intelligent software solution that interprets what people are saying about an organisation and calculates impact on brand and reputation. It takes vast amounts of information, stores it, measures the impact and illustrates the effects. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting really. <laughs> Software yeah, solution. And, and of course we've taken a pop at Shell, uh, we've been taking a pop at the oil industry and um, we, uh, we have certainly engaged with First Nations people in Canada uh, who would be deemed uh, to be against the, uh, the, the uh, tar, tar sands and, and uranium mining. So um, it's quite interesting that this crowd are uh, connected to uh, Nova Scotia, and of course we know that WPP LLC um, also work up there. But interestingly enough, uh, uh, well, we we could say that Arenda Solutions are not connected, but uh, the fact is that WPP is in Nova Scotia. It's a very small town, and uh, one of the major PR companies in that small part of the world um, would definitely be working with oil and mining interests. So it's it's just an interesting to see how. Uh, how things are are working behind the scenes because we've sort of been covering WPP and how they manipulate people's perception using the media and their internet uh, connections. Um, so and and in the third part of the show, I might point out we'll be we'll be discussing Air Code Capita. Um, so we'll be going for a few more uh, big names and uh, and uh, you know what their their game is all about uh, with with Uber and others. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that, that sort of gets that's sort of kind of my point on this one. I'm, as you're saying, I don't want to go on too much about it, and give them too too much credibility and time. But um, it has been uh, interesting uh, timing that, that we got that uh, particular referral. Well, um, it was because um, I think the scope of this surrender, I think, is, is quite intriguing, really, because. So basically what they're saying is to provide a higher level of insight, Arenda connects human ability with the power of data to give clients an accurate and deep understanding of what matters to them most. Uh, within moments, clients can access crucial insights that impact their brand and reputation, such as thousands of relevant exchanges on social media and how those conversations grow geographically. So uh, Arenda will be obviously coming to uh, a Facebook near you, I'd imagine, pretty soon. 2016, I think, is when they're set to properly kick off, but obviously they're in testing phase just at the minute. Um, I'd imagine that they're using uh, quite a complex web of spiders, I'd imagine, would be to, to troll the internet and, to, and, and just to gather up relevant data. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, uh, we, we were discussing the use of spiders to try and get around uh, Google censorship. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting area. Uh, we're kind of looking into it. Um, I would say that, uh, that, that uh, we're keeping an eye on things and uh, just seeing how they develop. Um, I, I, I like, the reason I think we brought it up this week is because I think we were quite intrigued with the connection between all the hacking that was going on and stuff like this. And uh, how, how's the hacking been this week? Uh, have they been leaving you alone after we publicised it? Oh, they left me alone basically all week. Uh, oh, I, I can't. Nice. Uh, I don't think I've had any hassles. And uh, you know, I didn't get around to getting organised. I suppose so. They're probably waiting for me to get my my software together here so that I can track them so <laughs> God only knows I'm still I'm still I'm still struggling with um, what's it called I'm still struggling with Metasploit and checking out the vulnerabilities which are hidden inside the source code of the Linux system but um, we'll get there we'll get there it's quite a complex uh, how, how is the Linux system because everybody's on about uh Windows 10 and uh, the fact it just gives all the information away and you have to go in and and shut down all the permissions uh, to to have a 
have a half of a secret uh, life, but as we know, I don't think Windows is going to be safe anyway. But how, how does, how's Linux certainly uh, matching up uh, to to all these sort of uh, trawling uh, things and hacking things that you're uh, aware of? Well, just from my own cursory tests on my own system, it it appears Slackware is holding up quite nicely, and and even even one of the most vulnerable uh, pieces of software, which is my Bash shell seems to be, uh, it seems to be immune to uh, metasploits, so that's not a bad sign. So um, but that could be, but but these uh, these vulnerability checkers do sometimes give up po uh, false positives as well. So you, you can't always go by. But I did run a few tests on stuff that was sort of like been marked as critical and urgent, and uh, metasploit didn't seem to be able to. Um, exploit them so uh, for the moment uh, my money is still on Slackware has been a, a pretty sound safe solution uh, I'll have to test a few others just to see it would be interesting um, because I've been hearing rumors about uh, Ubuntu possibly being uh, very very buggy and many many back doors so it, it, uh, Ubuntu would probably be a, 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 a good option to test at some stage uh, I think we might get some fairly interesting uh, positive results of a vulnerable system there that's just my idea anyway um, no idea about uh, Manjaro uh, Manjaro of course is based on Arch so I'd imagine like uh, Manjaro wouldn't be too bad okay so basically then we're sort of saying that Manjaro seems to be quite safe but we're also saying that you know your system even through your tour got hacked uh, so there was obviously some little glitches that they can play with, uh, some little uh, technicalities. Yeah, uh, as far yeah. as as far as the information on your computer, we can't turn around yet and say that it, that is safe. Uh, but uh, we could probably say that the operating system is is strong, and uh, certainly puts up with the hacking if, if there's hacking going on. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, that would be a fair comment. Uh. Uh, I'm not so sure about this Windows 10, uh, um, but then again, I never did like the sound of Windows. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I just don't trust an operating system that won't release its source code and let people have a look inside it. And it's not just for the security side of it. Like, well, uh, the, 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 the Windows user base at large, I think if they were given access to the operating system source code, they could probably do a pretty good job of fixing it up, I'd imagine. But you just got to... But unless you give the people the code to have a look at it and work it all out and uh, cr create their own patches, their own solutions to problems, uh, you know, Windows is always going to be an insecure operating system because, you know, it just yeah, lacks, yeah, I mean, it, it lacks the community report, base. Yeah, we did. Sorry, my God. Yeah, I'm just go I was just going to add that it just lacks the community base of a good solid network of people working together to to, to iron it out because <laughs> operating systems are massive, you know, they're huge. Right, right. So, I mean, we did get the report uh, out that uh, the US was talking with Google and Apple and uh, they, they really wanted to keep things like uh, backdoors in by the sound of things. Um, so, you know, obviously, in fairness to Apple and Google, um, they, they, they're sort of kind of being forced to do this under national security reasons, you know, uh, without the discussion being had about the viability of the internet if we leave back doors and, and things, you know. And we obviously described a, a dating site, a cheater's dating site that got hacked with all the details released, you know. <laughs> that, that could potentially ruin a lot of people's lives. Uh, but one simple hack. Um, so we're, we're seeing this sort of thing going on and it's, it, it is great evidence, unfortunately, it is great evidence of just how dire the, the internet could be in the future and, and it will be directly a resu resu result of security uh, uh, sort of uh, departments in various countries that have made the decision that uh, keep, keep the exploits open uh, regardless. Um, and we had a discussion about that last week. but. Uh, Anyway, so, uh, anything else to add on, on this uh, point, Jimmy? Uh, I'm just letting uh, Tisby know. Tisby was saying that the levels seem a bit lower but, uh, than usual, but everything looks okay at this end. But um, I'll keep an eye on that. I'll give everybody a little bit of extra volume. But, um, yeah, I just found it curious, while we, before we move away from this uh, hacking and, uh, 
and and this Oran's uh, <laughs> what are they called again? Oh, good God, I've forgotten her name. Uh, Oran Solution, Orenda Solution. There was a, an interview a few years back with uh, Linus Torvalds, the uh, the creator of the Linux operating system, and um, there was a. There was a lot of reporters and they were doing a big talk on Linux and uh, a point was making, made about how uh, Bill Gates was approached to install backdoors into the Windows operating system. Now the question was put to Linus, uh, had he ever been approached by the CIA NSA to install a backdoor on the Linux operating system and uh, curiously enough he kept it zipped. So yeah, didn't deny it. He didn't deny it. So I was, you know, he who denies admits, and isn't that the old maximum of law? But uh, like you're saying um, yourself, you're ch you're checking the system out yourself for vulnerabilities, and other people are as well. Plus, other people are reading the code. Um, so you know, we're, we're, the, there's ways and means of trying to uh, to actually uh, sort of uh, put in a, a more stable system. Right. I certainly know Windows. I went through two Windows operating systems, two different Windows operating systems, both of which got hacked. Uh, the first one, uh, yeah, was just uh, they kept the yeah, they kept the the processor running really hot, and it eventually burnt out a brand new processor. Whoa! Wow. And uh, the second time, uh, I went onto Windows uh, 98, good old reliable Windows 98, and within a day. Uh, this was so. This was within a week of each other. So uh, within a day of using that system, uh, they came in through the back door, um, went to the registry, deleted something from the registry, and then that was the end of that uh, that particular operating system. Uh, and then uh, I went on to Linux, obviously. Yeah, well, that is quite interesting that uh, that your CPU was uh, run hot because. Yeah. Um, th there's special features built into all these little gadgets uh, for testing purposes, basically. So, when they're when they're being created in the factory, uh, what what they can do is they can put it into a, a diagnostics mode, and they, so they can enable, say, save hard drives, so that they can run them at high speed uh, indefinitely to see how long they actually last. So while there is a good purpose to have these things built into the uh, into the chips and into the into the drives, uh, <laughs> it's funny how they can also be turned into be a negative thing. Also, so you know, you just got hit with okay. one of those uh, <laughs> with one of those built-in self-checking functions. <laughs> or our listeners could go and buy the uh, latest uh, Windows 10, which it comes with very glossy features, apparently. Well, I think there's a isn't a free upgrade just at the minute. Oh, I would be. I would not surprised with the uh, uh, <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> with the with the publicity they've been getting on it. Mm. <laughs> They'll be giving it away for sure. So, uh, all right. So, um, um, shall I hit a couple of European news uh, uh, sort of stories? Should we get into that? Sure, because I don't have actually I have a huge amount of European news. Um, I did, like we said earlier, I focus mainly on the Irish stuff, but I but I do have a little a couple of miscellaneous topics and a few European stories so um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you most of the time if you want it if you can use it. Alright well I've got a couple of quite interesting stories here and uh, I would uh, I would say basically I'd start off with the story I don't know if people got hold of it but uh, nine Americans en route to Ukraine were detained in the Austrian capital of Vienna for carrying assault rifles and handguns without proper clearance. Um, I've got this uh, story, I noticed the story was also on Shannon Watch, who have been complaining that US Marines have been coming into Shannon against uh, neutrality with weapons. So we've just got a little bit more evidence there of the US Marines who are not being searched and should be, um, basically by US Marines. Uh, so um, the US Marines uh, basically were travelling to Ukraine to participate in an exercise called Sabre Guardian uh, that began on July the 20th. Uh, the incident was reported to the media some 10 days after it happened, so that's why we're only getting to hear about it now. Uh, obviously, bad news travels slowly in the uh, Ministry of Defence world. Uh, the servicemen travelling on commercial flights from Alaska, uh, like they do in uh, Shannon, uh, had problems with a connecting flight at Vienna uh, uh, Chat Airport and had to leave the transit area and rebook. Australian uh, Austrian uh, Defence Ministry spokesman Colonel Michael Bauer said, 
Um, so airport security personnel found M16 assault rifles and pistols while scanning the Marines' luggage. <laughs> These soldiers had no permits allowing them to carry weapons uh, like they don't in uh, oh, Shannon God, Airport. Oh, God, oh, God. So, uh, <laughs> That's nuts. Surely, yeah. surely they must have known that they were not going to be getting through scanners at an international airport just like that, loaded up, loaded to the, loaded to the neck with guns. <laughs> it's just nuts. Well, nuts. we can see why Shannon Airport is so important to uh, the American uh, Army, you know, because they, you know, we've had uh, was it a million and a half uh, soldiers traveling through. I think the figure was quoted at by uh, John Lennon, so uh, somewhere around there. Uh, but. Uh, Anyway, that's, that's that kind of story. And if you want to go and read that, um, I actually went on to Press TV, U.S. Marines detained en route to Ukraine. Um, now, the, going back to the hacking thing, I just thought of something. Uh, I had terrible problems getting onto Press uh, TV uh, last night. And uh, I couldn't get onto it at all. And I eventually found a link that took me to an article, and then I was able to get to the home page via using the link on that article. But I couldn't do it through Google. Um, I believe. Uh, how did you get to, onto the press TV? What was your? You got. You managed to get on there, didn't you? Oh, like like everything else, I just type it straight into the address bar. So I don't, you know. Usually the places I go to, I know have them committed to memory. Ah, sure, sure. Yeah. So, so uh, but, but I was just uh, highlighting this point because it does seem to be. Uh, I have seen it again in another situation uh, where people can't get onto uh, a link. Uh, certain people. Can't and others can, and it's uh, it's just very odd. It seems like they're trying to block certainly uh, people uh, like myself who'd be uh, sharing those type of articles uh, with gusto. Well, when, um, when we talk about they, though, Sean, um, they. I've been noticing you've had a few issues from time to time uh, where you haven't been able to connect to the internet. And, uh, like uh, this morning, yeah. And then I'd get a call, and you said. Jimmy, <laughs> can't connect to the internet. So, um, first thing we do is we check your DNS settings, right? Uh -huh. And that's usually where the problem is. So, what I might suggest that you do in that situation, because I've, I've noticed your DNS records keep getting overwritten by the operating system. Um, uh -huh. And it's something got to do with the way it connects automatically to routers. So, what you can do is you can sort of like... Uh, make that file read only that it can't be written to even by the root account and, uh -huh. uh, and then what you do is you pick out a couple of really nice handy DNS servers which are free and which you know are coming from sources where that don't block content and then put Google servers right down the list so you can't be blocked to Google so you know you can have a whole list of name servers so <clears throat> you know if you're blocked sure. on one you could it'll, it'll check on others so um, it, you may just need to do yeah. your DNS records again we have a solution. We have a solution. We have solution. Anyway, as yeah. we're being as we're being picked on by mining companies, I've got another story here actually um, for uh, Orenda Solutions. Uh, a major UK-based mining company operating in Zambia has been polluting the drinking water in the African nation uh, to catastrophic levels. Uh, prompt legal action in the British courts by lawmakers representing hundreds of Zambian villages affected by toxic leaks. Now, uh, London-based Lee Day Law Firm, and they're the ones that are actually connected with Netpol and uh, sort of uh, uh, police. Was it um, against police surveillance? There's another uh, Facebook uh, account and group, um, and that Lee Day is kind of the main human rights uh, law. And these guys are kept so busy; they, they're booked two years in advance. So, and you can see why here. Uh, so they can't help many of the bloggers and. Uh, various other activists on, on these situations because they just haven't got the resources. Uh, uh, anyway, so anyway, they, they, this is this company, Lee Day Law Firm. I recommend them. They were really good to me and uh, they couldn't help me, but they did try very hard. Uh, they spent three days trying to track down a human rights lawyer. So, well, you know, big up to Lee Day Law. Um, so, anyway, issued, uh, they issued a proceedings in the High Court, the British capital, on behalf of 1,800 Zambians. They claim to have been suffering from massive pollution released by the Videnta Resources giant mine, a uh, giant mine in uh, Zambia Copper Belt region. Uh, the British Daily Guardian reported this on Saturday. Uh, the report cites uh, leaked documents and confidential internal report commissioned by the Canadian pollution control experts, showing that Videnta subsidiary KCAM has been spilling sulfuric acid and other toxic chemicals into rivers 
streams and underground aquifers used for drinking water near, near Zambian's mining town of Jingola. And of course, you know, we, we would also be looking at uranium or thorium uh, uh, sort of uh, pollution as well, but they wouldn't mention that. Uh, the result, according to the people in four villages near the huge 12 mile square mine, is stomach pains, illnesses, devastated crops, loss of earnings, and permanent injuries, uh, the report said. The case could take three years to resolve, said Lee Day's senior partner, Martin Day, who recently returned from Zambia, where a legal team has been taking witness statements from people living near the rivers and facilities operated by the British company. The claims by Zambian villagers living near one of the African's largest copper mines are supported by a leaked letter from a KCM physician confirming that water collective testing from Shumulala village in 2011 was unfit for human consumption. The water is acidic and the copper and iron levels exceed permitted levels, the letter further stated. The impurities can cause cancer in the bloodstream and unhealthy conditions in internal organs. Mm -hmm. uh, the people in the village should be advised to stop drinking, uh, stop using the same water. And a Vedenta spokesman said, all, all Vedentas operating subsidiaries take the health of their employees and the well-being of surrounding communities and the environment very seriously. Our subsidiaries are committed to ensuring they operate in a safe and sustainable way. Well, that's why they're in court, obviously. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Oh, and we've, we've seen, uh, obviously, we, we had Candice uh, Paul talking about uranium pollution uh, all over the uh, area where uh, the Dene tribe uh, are sort of living. There's 13,000 people that were affected by the wildfires uh, recently in that tribe. Um, and, and they basically had, uh, had the very great concern that the uranium that had been filtered out of these mines, the, this in slurry or whatever, uh, basically worked its way into the ecosystem, up the roots into the trees and plants, um, and was being released by the fires, uh, very much in the same way that we've seen in Chernobyl a couple of times this year. Uh, we've seen forest fires uh, which have been uh, uplifting uh, cesium. Um, I have one little interesting story about that as well, uh, uh, but uh, an unknown author, shall we say, uh, was doing uh, some study on the Chernobyl fires and checked the wind flow patterns uh, using a special program uh, for uh, fallout and what have you um, and pollution. So uh, they did a, an article, it was for RT, and uh, RT basically turned around and didn't print the article. Uh, why, you might ask? Well, because they had worked out that the forest fires at that particular time, uh, that particular forest fire, the uh, pollution, the fallout, if you like, from the, uh, the uplifted cesium-soaked wood uh, had basically dropped in Moscow. So um, they thought that probably wouldn't be a good story to go with on RT because they are a bit pro-nuke. And we'll be coming back to uh, Russia a little bit later on in the program. We're going to have a little bit of a, a Russian bashing uh, uh, program today, although we do like RT generally. Um, right, so uh, with that in mind, I would then go on to uh, our next uh, sort of situation. Um, and uh, now this is quite an odd one. Uh, this is going back to the UK again. Um, so there's a case that was uh, re uh, revealed for the first time about ethnic minority officers in the UK. Uh, there's a the bizarre case of uh, Gupal Verdi, uh, who, uh, scandalous as it may be, uh, I'll just quote from the article, it's not in any way unusual apart from his perseverance in fighting his adversaries and seeking justice. His case stands as yet more hard proof that contrary to assumption most people make, the system is, is just, of justice is entirely broken uh, throughout the Atlantic world, uh, with the security apparatus largely free to do whatever its members like to others and even to their own without fear of consequences, uh, a London-based international lawyer, Barry Grossman, told uh, Press TV. He noted that the political establishment everywhere is now entirely focused on generating endless reams of new corporatist legislation to satisfy the lobbyists, uh, adding the legislative branch of government long ago abandoned its primary role in carrying out oversight of the bureaucratic branch of government. He went on to say, and I have to quote this, but the rule of law is dead and buried. We now live in an era of uh, dominated by pub, uh, policy and the pe petty bureaucrats who implement it. While we are still norm nominally have mechanisms which are meant to ensure accountability, mechanisms like, for example, 
internal investigative units and the Ombudsman Office, those mechanisms have been fully compromised by legis legislative uh, restrictions and have been turn turned investigators mostly into toothless tigers while the budgets for uh, operating these complaint mechanisms have constantly been reduced, he said. Uh, that's another article on Press TV. Uh, also pro-nuke, by the way, Press TV. <laughs> it's very <laughs> sad. Uh, it has to be mentioned on the, you know, as we're coming up to the, uh, the very somber moment of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, nuclear explosions that uh, most of the press, even the, the better press uh, that does more independent stuff, uh, you know, they, they are kind of pro-nuke and we'll get, we'll, you know, all news is, uh, is uh, sort of kind of slanted, so we should always be cautious about our sources. Um, all right, so there's, uh, there's also a story there which I'll just quickly go on to. They're saying a number of British human rights organisations have censured the expanding military ties between London and Cairo. The UK should be condemning the appalling human rights abuses that are taking place in Egypt said CAAT researcher Andrew Smith. However, these increasing arms sales and the forthcoming visit suggest that the government wants to strengthen its ties with Cairo, Cairo, Cairo he added. Uh, and of course, we have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, the militarization of that part of the world and the uh, military actions that have occurred by Western countries have uh, increased the immigrants into Europe. Uh, the, the stream of immigrants into Europe, especially Italy, Greece, and these other countries, um, and so therefore, they, you know, we're seeing uh, David Cameron at the moment wanting to send in the dogs to Calais, um, and uh, I have to say that a, a bishop in the UK has stepped out and said, "Please, David Cameron, where is your humanity? You know, uh, before you start sending all these uh, dogs and military kind of personnel to Calais." to deal with people that are uh, families and uh, single people that are, that are on the run from the wars that, uh, that unfortunately we seem to be causing, you know? Uh, does, does, does that not call into question um, the, 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 the whole concept of France being a, a sovereign nation as well? Like if, uh, if troops from England are going to arrive on, on the French border, <laughs> that's pretty nuts, I have to say. Nuts. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. It's, uh, <clears throat> I, th I think at the end of the day we have to, uh, we, uh, the press is just, is just absolutely terrible, you know. It's, it's well, there was an interesting video there I've seen during the week and uh, somebody from uh, Sky News, I think, went into video uh, and interview a, a couple of the, uh, of the refugees who were trying to, to get through to England and uh, one, one lad in particular, uh, he's basically not allowed to pass through uh, France and over to England. His wife apparently is in England uh, with, with his children and stuff and he can't get through. So it, it, and he, he, just, he, he was drawing up some serious comparisons about uh, the amount of, of destruction that's been caused in places like Iraq. Uh, and in Libya, uh, he was from Algeria himself, uh, Afghanistan, like, and about how people are now on the run from 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 a war zone, basically created by uh, a, a, a conglomeration of the USA, England, France, you name it. Like they're they're all involved in it in some way, shape, or form, and these people are on the run. So. Um, we, we we all have a share in the responsibility for what's going on there. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and, it, and it goes on and on. I mean, I, I was reading Facebook. Um, I think uh, Donald O'Kelly, who was um, basically on Facebook, and he's an artist, an author, uh, actor, uh, playwright. So he, he's uh, he's also very involved with the Palestinian uh, situation. Um, and uh, I did notice that he was saying, "Well, what's going on with with Yemen? You know, what's happening in Yemen? You know, there was a kind of a war going on over there, and it's all gone quiet um, now." What's happening is really is that we've got we, we do have a war going on over there, whether they're saying there's there's a war there or not, um, and uh, you know we've got uh, Yemeni forces at the moment uh, uh, in a report yesterday. Yemeni forces attack Saudi army base in Jizan, um, and th this is quite serious because this is a, a real. Uh, if there was any sort of agreements for peace, uh, that would have uh, definitely closed it. Um, and the Saudi, there has been attacks on Saudi uh, uh, sort of border sort of places with rockets and what have you um, as a warning to the Saudis, uh, you know, about what they were doing. Uh, 
Um, and we could see this Yemeni uh, thing sort of really kick off. You know, we have uh, Ethiopia not far, you know, not far away. We have a lot of people that have been displaced, and uh, certainly a lot of possible recruits for another, uh, maybe not ISIS-like uh, army, but just another army. Um, and uh, basically, it's uh, you know, and there's plenty of weapons, and we're seeing more weapons going to uh, Egypt and everywhere else, and. You know, these are very corrupt countries. You know, the people that are in the army in Egypt are all conscripted. Uh, there's, uh, they're not there because they they believe in the joyous wonderfulness of being in the army. They're being forced to join the army, and they come from many different hues and shapes uh, and political uh, and religious backgrounds. Um, and so we're trusting all these weapons we're sending over to people that you know we could consider could be much more corrupt than say. Uh, the Irish Army, for instance, we wouldn't imagine the Irish Army necessarily to be taking backhanders um, for a, a truckload of weapons or missiles or bombs. So, you know, um, but that's a story I thought I'd bring out. And you know, uh, I think uh, Donald was saying, "Well, how does that work? You know, how, why aren't we hearing about it?" Um, well, we're not hearing about it because in May, WPP, who we report on quite a lot on this radio show at the moment, um, basically has turned around uh, and, as well as being uh, in Shell Oil in Ireland and uh, in the Gulf BP and as well as being in uh, Fukushima dealing with that for the Japanese government uh, and they, we've talked about the similar techniques being used against the locals and uh, in the press and how they work the whole situation uh, we see that they had a new uh, managing director for the uh, WPP subsidiary that works in uh, Saudi and, uh, and in that area and uh, they're basically uh, they got that in May, just just before the Yemen uh, war broke out, I believe. So it's uh, quite interesting timing, and they're certainly over there managing the press, and certainly being able to manage the Western press uh, the most. So this story came in from Press TV, uh, the one that I couldn't get onto last night. Well, I did after a lot of trying, but uh, but it it, uh, it wasn't straightforward. So. Um, now we've got um, WikiLeaks reveal CBC and Canada Post may be sold under TPP agreement. Uh, TPP being the um, agreement with uh, the Pacific states. Um, and we're seeing CBC, which we reported last week as coming out and actually doing a, a human, uh, a human uh, sort of uh, story uh, about. Uh, the fires, and it was a repeat of the, the the interview we did with Candice Pauls concerning the plight of the people left uh, where all these fires have been raging, um, and the issues that, that uh, in the future that they've got just from that damage. So, uh, and the Canada Post, and because in part three, hour three, we'll be talking about uh, the uh, Irish uh, postal system and what's the chances of it getting privatised. Um, so we're seeing CBC. Uh, which is a, a, a sort of a, 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 a national broadcaster, and they do sometimes have some good stuff on. You know, I do follow them a little bit. Uh, and the Canada Post, uh, we're seeing, is uh, is uh, possibly you know going to be sold under TPP agreement. Very relevant to Ireland with the water issue, um, and we've just had the European courts come out and say that uh, Ireland has to privatise its uh, water, uh, you know, industry. So. Uh, that's uh, that, that's something that uh, a story that came out, but I haven't got the details on that yet. But uh, for any Irish people out there, uh, do a bit of a Google. I'm sure you'll come across that story. Um, right. So that's another little story I was going to show there. And uh, now um, I, I basically because this is you know with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I'm going to drop this little story in here as well. Now. There's more than 50 university, universities in Japan have officially, officially said no to the new security bill that would allow Japanese to join the wars around the world. Right? So uh, rage against the Abe LDP uh, uh, is happening even from national universities. Um, so democracy seems to be uh, rearing its ugly head uh, against the Japanese government's wishes. Um, so well done everybody in Japan and well done the universities because uh, we do take a pop at the universities for science stories and things but uh, sometimes they come good and sometimes they, they get undermined depending on who's funding them and which country they are. But um, 
Now there is another little story. This is a kind of a, a good good news story, sort of. Um, there's a judgment that called into question the actions and motivation of London Mayor Boris Johnson, the Metropolitan Police, and the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK. Uh, the uh, Greater London Authority revealed that policing costs between mid-October and mid-February were 1,945. Uh, sorry, one million. 945,279, a bit of a difference. Um, now, we've been covering the Occupy. There are a group of maybe up to 20 people that were doing regular um, sort of protests. They actually only did 17 days of protest during that, that those months. Um, and somehow the, uh, the cost got up to nearly two, two million pounds, you know, four, four million dollars, three and a half million dollars, or about the three million euros just over. Um, and that was just to keep the Occupy Democracy protesters uh, in place. Uh, now, they basically had turned around. I'll, 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 I'll just read the article that, I, um, that I've got, which is from o o OccupyDemocracy.org. So I, I think it's worth a mention. They put some interesting figures in. So Occupy Democracy protested for 17 days during this time, making the average cost of policing 112000 a day based on the uh, basic officer salary of 19000 uh, for working 233 days per year. This means per day, policing the square could have paid for 1,354 uh, police officers. Uh, Varnum added, the CPS decision to prosecute in this case goes against their own guidelines, which state that peaceful protesters should not be prosecuted. This raises serious questions of whether prosecutions were so doggedly pursued in order to justify the mayor's decision to close the square, which is itself subject to judicial review proceedings. This unlawful clampdown of peaceful protest and gross waste of public money is unjust justifiable with a bill set to increase if those whose cases have been dismissed uh, recently pursue the police in civil actions for unlawful arrest. The judgment coincides with a blow to the City of London police, who, following a freedom of information request by The Guardian, were found to categorise the Occupy movement as a domestic extremists. And, of course, we've been covering uh, the story of domestic extremists and uh, of Lee Day, who we did that story about just a little while back, uh, who actually end up trying to help all the growing numbers of domestic extremists uh, um, when they can but obviously they're two years behind on their workload and they're not legally allowed to take too much more on. Uh, the justice, I'll go on with the uh, article, uh, it's just nearly finished. The justice and equality movement were pictured on a slide alongside the 7-7 terrorist attacks. Jamie Kelsey Fry, a supporter of Occupy London, said, if you were to measure the power in an idea by the extent to which it is suppressed, then Occupy were articulating something profound. So that was quite a nice little uh, quote there I picked up. And you can get that on occupydemocracy.org.uk. So, and uh, yeah, Occupy Democracy cases, the dismissed in court. So well done, everybody over there. Twelve peaceful protesters have charges dropped in the first two trials. The judge, rule, judge rules that the tarpaulin, which they were uh, just sitting on, it was not a structure uh, designed or adapted for sleeping. So uh, the police spent... Uh, Two million uh, to uh, take all that through. I don't know if that includes the cost of the court cases as well. I doubt it. They didn't, they didn't say that. Anyway, so uh, we've been covering the hungry PM, who's always good for a quote or two. <laughs> and uh, and this is an, a Guardian article, so I'll, I'll just go through this, and you can check it up on the Guardian. And, and uh, but uh, the hungry PM has made a rivers of blood speech, a bit like Enoch Powell in the UK, and no one cares. So. Uh, Basically, uh, we were talking about N. Nikeni and his, uh, his uh, kind of friendship with the Hungary, Hungary PM. Uh, we've also been talking about Hungary really trying to resist helping refugees and wanting to treat them as criminals. Um, and we're seeing that in the UK as well. Um, luckily, we're not seeing that in Ireland yet. But uh, these are the guys they're sort of hanging out with. So let's hope that's not going to well, be Well, I'm not case. so sure about that. There was that case there quite recently where that young man was picked up on the M50, I believe. Uh, yeah. Where was he? Where did he come out Afghan. of? Afghan. It was Afghanistan. It was Afghanistan, it? yeah. He was picked up and he was chucked into, into prison, wasn't he? Where he nearly lost his life. Um, yeah. He ended up getting uh, that, that razor wire wrapped around his neck, by, by I believe, by inmates. And he was eventually saved by prison guards, as far as I know. 
but um you know it's it's questionable the uh, the irish approach to 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 people uh, who are refugees so uh, we just have to watch that situation well, and see how it develops it's a quite shame that the prisoners uh, did that because if they just thought for a moment that uh, that could be them one day running away from ireland uh, and you know it's not too unbelievable if i have to run away from england uh, i'm sure criminals you know who would be facing definite sentences uh, at some point may need to be fleeing different countries and the last thing they'd want to be doing is going to somewhere in Europe where when they got put into prison there uh, for good or uh, bad reasons uh, that they would basically have raisin or wire stuck around their neck or have uh, be tortured in any uh, way shape or form uh, but um, I suppose rea in, rea in fairness to the prisoners they've, they're not aware of what's actually happened in Afghanistan and uh, I've actually met people from Afghanistan in the UK, my neighbour was one, uh, and they, they're very upstanding, very polite, very nice people. And let me tell you, it's the very nice people that uh, try the hardest to get out of uh, a place that's uh, very corrupt and uh, very dangerous to live in. Um, and I, I might say that for quite a lot of the refugees. People that are uh, kind of nasty, they tend to stay in places like that because they can make... Uh, make them make a, a place for themselves uh, people that are good who have families uh, that, uh, that are kind to people that believe in uh, a God in the same way that Christians believe in a God uh, then they would be uh, very peaceful and uh, it would be a matter of honor honor for them especially in Afghanistan to treat people respectfully it's part of their culture so maybe we just don't understand the cultures that we're attacking and uh, that's a shame. Well, either way, that young man was uh, very unfortunate to meet some very unsavoury characters in, 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 in the Irish prison system. So it's just a pity. It's not a great advertisement for our people, um, to, to, for, for like people from abroad to be bringing off with them when they leave the shores here. So, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a sad indictment of our own people in, in a sense, you know. Uh, there's quite a lot of well, our, we're, we're seeing, mind. We're seeing the governments uh, trying to push the meme. That, uh, that immigrants, whoever they are, these immigrants, this word, uh, they, they are not like us. They are inhuman. Uh, and in fact, if you go over to Russell Brand on the Trues, they, they did uh, quite a good uh, skit on homeless people in America, uh, where uh, Bill O'Reilly's team was going out hassling uh, uh, sort of people with uh, mental health difficulties, showing how inhuman they were and how unworthy they are of any respect from anyone. Uh, well, let's, let's refer everyone to the bishop uh, in the UK who's pleading with Tony Blair to take another sort of uh, uh, view on this. And, you know, in terms of uh, Ireland, going back to that, you know, Irish people have had to flee Ireland because of poverty and they had to go to a country where they were, uh, were terrorised for being Irish. And uh, the Irish nowadays might be feeling quite comfortable about kind of going over to the UK, but that may not always be so because as they run out of the, uh, the, uh, the sort of people that they're picking on, uh, they will then be looking at other groups uh, who don't fit into the English uh, sort of cycle. And uh, I would say most Catholics uh, would probably fit into that uh, sort of uh, branch, uh, except for Tony Blair, of course, who is actually probably the devil in disguise, incarnate, pretending to be a Catholic. Uh, he's certainly not listening to the Pope, is he? No, well, in general, these people don't listen to anybody. No. But uh, anyway, Assange, the untold story of an epic struggle for justice. Uh, if you go over to johnpilger.com and you can get your update dose on Assange, um, <laughs> basically, uh, who is still, who is still uh, locked away by the UK uh, illegally, in my opinion. And uh, so basically we'll... Uh, uh, and, and we're seeing how the press is being manipulated not to report on him. But pop over to John Pilger, uh, a great uh, writer and reporter and journalist. Um, and uh, yeah, I would just po point you over there, check out what's going on with Assange. And of course, uh, WikiLeaks uh, was quite high on the agenda this week, wasn't it? Uh, I believe. Uh, I'm not so sure, Sean. I wasn't paying too much attention to WikiLeaks now uh, this week. As I know there's so many things to keep a track of, isn't there? So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's quite interesting. But uh, WikiLeaks obviously have been uh, keeping up with the TTIP information, which is really good. And they've uh, recently, I think one of their latest uh, sort of uh, uh, publishers, uh, things they've published is uh, Target Tokyo. 
uh, where, um, which is appropriate for this uh, week's show. Um, and uh, they're talking about uh, 35 top secret NSA targets in Japan, including the Japanese cabinet, Japanese companies such as Mitsubishi, and together with the Intercept's uh, relation to US-Japan relations. Uh, of course, we're talking uh, about the Okinawa um, sort of uh, military base that the Okinawans are trying to close down. Um, and, you know, they've had rapes and social issues because of it. Uh, they've got pollution from Agent Orange and all sorts of other things. Uh, they've just had, a, had enough of having a military base on their lands, uh, somebody else's military base as well. Um, so uh, we've, we've been looking at uh, how Japan has uh, the Japanese government, for some unknown, known unre odd reason, has totally uh, uh, ignored the democratic processes and the peaceful processes that have uh, brought the uh, situation to a head. And they're trying to uh, close down newspapers that are supportive of the majority of the population in Okinawa. So it's, it's, uh, we've got that in the background. Plus, we had Fukushima. The NSA desperately needs to make sure that no bad news gets out about uh, um, sort of uh, what's happening with Fukushima. And you'll be hearing about that in hour two. So what we're looking at really is, uh, is uh, there you are. WikiLeaks is bringing out that information. Uh, and it, uh, that was out on the 31st. Uh, there's also the TPP, SOE issues for ministerial guidance. So um, basically that will be July the 29th, uh, July the 29th. Uh, and they uh, released a secret letter from Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreements uh, Minister meeting in December 2013, along with a comprehensive expert analysis of the document. And the whole document is obviously on WikiLeaks, God bless them. Um, so we are seeing a, a little bit more uh, info coming out there. They seem to be a bit busier than The Intercept. Uh, just quickly, The Intercept, uh, there's certainly some uh, goings on with the uh, person uh, the uh, person who, uh, I can't remember his name, Odami, uh, the Facebook guy. Um, anyway, he basically uh, seems to be getting involved in all sorts of strange uh, uh, sort of American uh, uh, NGOs that seem to be funding revolutions, and there's certainly something in Russia with that. Um, and I would also say with Russia, Bologna has uh, basically had another article, a couple of articles going on about um, the uh, Olympics in Sochi uh, last year. Was it last year or the year before? Uh, but anyway, it was, uh, I think it was last year, sorry. And uh, one of the um, uh, people there was basically uh, campaigning against environmental issues that had occurred. And uh, we've uh, just got an update, basically, uh, from, from them. And uh, I'm just trying to find it at the moment, he says. Oh, all right, excuse me, I was going to have to go over to Bologna straight away. But uh, it's an article by Charles Diggs, and he actually uh, has been on our show. And um, basically his friend... He's now his friend because he goes and visits him in prison. They're trying to get him out, basically, uh, because he's, um, you know, he's, he's having, uh, you know, he's been arrested for graffiti of offence, and the offence may not exist. Um, so they've tried to get an early uh, sort of, so this is after a year, basically. They've been trying to get uh, him at, released, basically, because this is a load of rubbish. Um, and his name is Yevgeny Vichinko, and um, basically uh, Charles has been going in there, has been talking to him and uh, uh, trying to get the story. Um, he's had to fly the gamut of the FSB at the airport who, who wants his information. Um, but uh, to get it right, uh, vi vi uh, the Olympic sentence, so the Vichinko, Vichin sorry, I should say Vitishko, Vitishko with his uh, colleagues at the Environmental Watch of North Caucasus, uh, spent years presenting evidence of environmental devastation and corruption in the lead up to President Vladimir Putin's prize 51 billion Sochi Winter Games Olympics in 2014. Their investigations carried out under conditions of constant surveillance, police harassment and trumped up arrests, culminating a damning report released during the Olympics. Uh, Vyshenko is one of the uh, report's principal authors. And of course you'd ask, well why isn't this in the mainstream? Because this is anti-Russian, they'd love all this. but. In fact, they don't like this one because it's actually about an environmentalist who is uh, 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 pointing out the issues with the, uh, with the Olympics. You know. And we have issues in China at the moment uh, with the Olympics. So 
uh, when we're looking at that, we've got um, uh, where is that story? That's uh, oh, heaven's sake. My stories are all disappearing. Well, they're not really, but uh, okay. Human rights activists aim to thwart China's bid to host the 2022 Winter Olympics. Uh, we've also got in Rio, in Brazil, uh, we've got the um, uh, there's some sea uh, sort of uh, sailing uh, uh, parts of the Olympics is going on there. Will be going on there. Uh, they're doing some. Uh, some people have been there training, and they've started coming around with uh, built uh, sort of lots of bugs and uh, skin rashes. Uh, because the water is so polluted with fecal matter. Um, so that's uh, just another Olympic story. And of course, we've got the 2012 Olympics coming up, uh, some of which will be in Fukushima, which the Japanese government and uh, Ogilvy and Mather and uh, their uh, subsidiaries in the press and media uh, would say that there is no problem there at all. And that would be backed up by the Science Media Centre, uh, run by Fiona Fox, who would uh, certainly say that uh, it wouldn't matter anyway because uh, radiation is not harmful. It's probably even good for you. So uh, that's, that's those stories. Um, yeah, there was quite an interesting story I'd also bring people to, stopwar.org.uk by uh, Stop the War Coalition, uh, and they've got an article entitled Proving the Link Between UK Foreign Policy and Domestic Terrorism, uh, whatever Blair and Cameron say, because they, they just will not go there. That is not an argument that they will uh, take on, and they're certainly not taking on the same argument in terms of immigration either, so that's quite uh, heartbreaking. Right, so uh, have you got anything to add, uh, Jimmy? Um, yeah. Well, we've got a, Germany seems to have opened up a, a treason investigation into a news website. Um, basically, German media said it was the first time in more than 50 years journalists had faced treason charges and some denounced the moves as an attack on freedom of press. Now, the federal prosecutor uh, started the investigation on suspicion of treason into the articles published uh, on the internet blog netzpolitik.org. Um, she added that uh, the move followed a criminal complaint by Germany's domestic intelligence agency, the Office for the Protection of the Constitution, uh, the BIV, over articles about BIV that appeared on the website on the 25th of February uh, and the uh, 15th of April, uh, and that the, it said that the articles were based on leaked documents. Uh, the prosecutor broadcaster already reported uh, netpolitik.org had published an article on how the BIV was seeking extra funding to increase its online surveillance and uh, another about plans to set up a special unit to monitor social media based on leaked confidential documents. Now, interestingly enough, the, 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 I think the last time, uh, it was 50 years ago since uh, the last treason charges were brought against I think it was Der Spiegel for a cover story alleging West Germany's armed forces were unprepared to defend itself against a communist threat in the Cold War. So, um, also coming out with Germany, um, Facebook has been told to allow people to uh, to use pseudonyms on on its site by a German regulator, which has ruled that the site's real name policy violates the rights to privacy. Uh, and that the Hamburg uh, Data Protection Authority said on Tuesday that the site could not force users to give official IDs such as passport or identity card, nor could it unilaterally change uh, their chosen names to their real names on the site. So that was a quite interesting move there in Germany. Sure. Uh, um, also, I'm just going to quickly put in that Naomi Wolf has had one or two little problems with her Facebook again this week, uh, but uh, nothing too bad. She's been posting away. And one story she managed to get was uh, Norway joins criticism of Israel settlement expansion. So uh, that's another country that uh, that sort of stood up and said, "Look, hey, come on, Israel, you've really you've really gone a bit overboard here. You've gone too far." Uh, or that article can be found in uh, regeringen uh, no. Uh, that's r e g j e r i n g e n dot n o. So, uh, but uh, that's uh, quite an interesting story. Right then. And, uh, all right, I suppose we're going to get into the second part, which is the, uh, uh, the interview with uh, Hervé Courtois, uh, anti-nuclear activist and uh, blogger. And uh, we're going to get an update on, uh, on Fukushima. We're going to look at how relevant it is and what the connections are between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
Well, indeed. Uh, but before we go there, right? Mm. Um, interestingly enough, we had a report here last week concerning uh, Peter Wadhams, right? Um, do you remember that yes. report? Where, yeah. Uh, see, since this is the, uh, we don't have an extinction report this week, unfortunately. Uh, our, our man Kevin uh, could not make it, so hopefully we'll have him back next week. But um, basically, this is an article that come out of uh, Robin Westenra dot blogs blogspot.co.nz and the question was asked uh, does UK climate scientist uh, the sea and ice researcher Professor Peter Wadhams think three of his peers were assassinated now if you've read the story uh, as it quickly well, the spread times, it, wasn't it the times it, put the story out well, yeah, I was just getting said, to that there yeah basically so if you've read the story it, it was spreading around anyway during the week and uh, but um, the smug asked West Enra last night if he believed the deaths of scientists Seymour Laxon, Catherine Giles and Tim Boyd were anything other than tragic accidents. And Wadham told us, no, they certainly, they were clearly accidents. So, um, so basically, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, what can we say? Well, what can on, we the, say? on the other side of the coin and in balance, uh, Peter Wadhams was actually interviewed afterwards. And what he said was, was that he said he wouldn't say that. He said he may have said something off off the uh, record, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of conversation and joviality kind of thing. But he wasn't he wasn't you know it's not something that he would make a, a comment on um, in a public sense. So what it was, and then we have to bear in mind the times they were kind of into a bit of the old climate denial. Okay, so they would love to do hit pieces on climate scientists, and uh, Wadhams is certainly one of the most you know harder working out there sort of scientists. Now what it was, he actually did say that. It's highly likely he said something like that and it was out of uh, the recording. So it was like when we have an interview we tell people we're not recording and we talk and then we say right we're going into recording now, are you ready? And then we do our record. Um, now what the Times did is that they recorded him uh, when they were having that little pre-chat where you could be uh, talking jovially uh, and saying, oh yeah, you know, they're all bumped off. And you could say it in a way that's joking, but if, uh, if they want to transcribe it, it would come out like it was a statement, um, a factual statement. So uh, he actually did come back, come back on that one, and he did say that, in fact, actually, he didn't think that, there were, that the three were bumped off. It was most likely uh, an accident. He said, but the, the evidence is out there, isn't out there to prove one way or the other, except for the evidence saying that they had tragic accidents. Um, now, you know, I suppose if we think about it, with the, you know, tens of thousands of uh, uh, scientists and uh, specialists, in, uh, certainly involved with the Arctic, there's many thousands, uh, that three, uh, three scientists uh, would make much of a difference. Um, but the difference really would be the time was leading with that story, getting everybody to talk about it and trying to undermine a climate scientist. Uh, that, that would certainly make sense to me and that's how I kind of read it when I sort of found out what, uh, what Wadham's uh, re response was. Uh, and the Times response to, the, to, the, to his statement was, well we've got it recorded. <laughs> Which means basically that they did record it out of uh, the interview, you know, the, the, the allowable bit, if you like. So they secretly recorded it when he was just talking and they took him out of context. That's the main thing there. So uh, obviously we've seen Naomi Wolf bust got The Guardian uh, and The New York Times and The Guardian and New York Times never come back and apologize, you know. Um, they, they just, you know, on various stories to do with ISIS and what have you, Naomi Wolf's got, you know, called the shop from straight away, looked at the sources, uh, found it, stories that are weak or found correct versions of stories. And, uh, you know, fortunately we do have a, an alternative media that is assessing what the press is putting out. But in this one, from my perspective, the Times, very pro-industry, coal, nuke, uh, they're basically you know they 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 want uh, they want the climate scientists to get uh, get a knock, and we know that uh, Fiona Fox, head of the Science Media Centre, who they get their specialists from in the UK in media terms, um, well, basically she was on a blog which was openly anti-climate change uh, and very pro Koch uh, um, Koch brothers 
and very pro-industry, uh, uh, whether it be fossil fuel or nuclear. So, and she's the one running the science media in the UK now, and uh, probably in quite a lot of other countries as well. Uh, Reuters uh, turned around and dropped them because they were too biased. But uh, anyway, that's that uh, little update mm. and uh, my, my view on that story. Oh, well, I guess the, the moral of the story is just uh, be careful what you say out of, uh, about what you read sometimes because it's not always quite true. Well, I think it's a little bit unfair to take, you know, if you're doing an interview, you report on it. It's very, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't like to be talking um, on something that, uh, that I wouldn't like to record people secretly, you know, I think that, that uh, we don't need to do that, you know. There's well, enough, look at uh, you, you know, there's nothing wrong with recording there, so long as you don't put into the public uh, without the, uh, the, the, the other end of the calls, uh, sort of like a uh, permission in a sense, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, it's you, sort yeah, of there technique has to be you sort of, like, there has to be a sort of amount of transparency in it, like, you know. Yeah, we have I was to saying it's the sort of technique you might use if you're going to Irish water. Uh, hang on a minute, I've just got the police uh, driving by. Run, run, run. So also, uh, just while we're on this climate change thing and before we bring in this interview with, with Herve, uh, Iran has been getting hammered there during the week uh, with uh, absolutely humongous temperatures, uh, 165 degrees, uh, which is uh, 74 Celsius. Uh, and to, to achieve today's astronomical heat index level of 165 uh, in Brandar Masharars, uh, the actual air temperature reg registered at 115 degrees or 46 Celsius with an astonishing dew point temperature of 32 degrees Celsius. And uh, also over in Baghdad, Baghdad uh, the temperatures also soar to 122 degrees or 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, but the dew point was a bit lower at uh, 44 degrees uh, Celsius. So, uh, yeah, we're seeing some serious temperatures around the world just at the minute. And well, uh, we've also reported. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. We've also reported on contrails that affect the you know in Europe that affect uh, the rain patterns and that have been uh, um, stopping rain getting to Iran. Um, and you know this is a threat to their nuclear industry. You know because nuclear. Uh, nuclear reactors don't like hot weather but um, you know but this is also a cut part of the airplane contrails that are causing uh, uh, unusual cloud formations that that uh, deposit in different ways and we're, we're seeing massive flooding on the west coast of, uh, of Europe uh, Norway or the uh, uh, UK and Ireland um, and we're seeing uh, uh, you know, incredibly cold temperatures, you know, in the middle of the summer here, you know, we've, it's been really cold. Um, and uh, meanwhile, we've been getting, as we head uh, way further down the sort of uh, the, the, the weather, we're getting sort of uh, fires in Chernobyl, very hot uh, spots in Paris. And uh, certainly when we get far, all the way down to Iran, there must be very little in the way of uh, uh, precipitation coming from uh, the jet stream, you know. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I think that's also a contributing factor that might be worth mentioning. No, and also interesting too is about final climate one for today. Uh, uh, hot water killing off uh, fish in the Columbia River, uh, sockeye salmon basically. So more than a quarter of a million sockeye salmon returning from the ocean to spawn are either dead or dying in the Columbia River uh, and its tributaries due to warming water temperatures. Now the federal and state fisheries biologists say the warm water is lethal for the cold water species and is wiping out at least half of this year's return of 500,000 fish. And also elsewhere in the region, uh, state fisheries uh, biologists in Oregon say more than 100 spring uh, Chinook uh, died earlier in the month uh, in, the, in the middle fork of the John Day River uh, when water temperatures hit uh, mid-70s. Oregon and Washington states have uh, both enacted sport fishing closures due to warm water and sturgeon fish in the Columbia River upstream uh, of Bonneville Dam have been halted uh, after some of the large bottom dwelling fish started turning up dead. Now efforts by management teams to cool the flows below 70 degrees by releasing cold water from selected reservoirs are continuing in an attempt to prevent similar fish kills uh, among Chinook salmon and steelhead which migrate later in the summer from the Pacific Ocean. Now, that was also reported on RT, but that article was out of 
the OregonLive.com. So that's my final one on the climate change department. All right. Well, I've, I've got one here, which is uh, Britain's secret ties to government firms behind ISIS oil sales. And it's by Nafiz Ahmed. Um, and it's uh, published by Insurge Intelligence, which is a new crowdfunded investigative journalist project. Um, so it's the, uh, uh, was it uh, medium.com? Um, and they're saying in the scramble to access Kurdistan's oil and gas wealth, the US, UK are turning a blind eye to complicity in the Islamic State oil smuggling. So we, we've heard stories that uh, there's uh, certainly uh, political connections between ISIS and the State Department. And, uh, we're also seeing that uh, they're uh, not just being used maybe to uh, have the uh, Kurds attacked, you know, um, because the Turkey apparently have been attacking the uh, Kurdish uh, PKK um, uh, more than they have the ISIS. And, uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, uh, was it the Kurdish uh, people's uh, uh, sort of government has asked the PKK to move because they don't want to get bombed by the Turkish. Um, so much for the war on ISIS, uh, but I, that was another little story there, uh, about another uh, sort of angle uh, about the complicity with oil smuggling. Uh, so there's a, a really good story there on the medium.com and look for the Nafis Ahmed article, Britain's secret ties to governments, firms behind ISIS oil sales. So it says it all, doesn't it, really? So, what do you think then? Will we go ahead and we'll play our uh, pre-record that we've done this morning at 10am uh, or thereabouts with uh, Herve C Courtois? I think you're right, uh, but before we do, I'd just like to say good one Jon Snow, who managed to get some uh, artwork out under the noses from Gaza, under the noses of uh, the uh, IDF, uh, and uh, you know he's, he's taking a big risk doing that. And uh, it has to be said, you know, he's, he did it for art reasons. But I think he really did it just to, uh, because he was so shocked about what happened in Gaza last year. And indeed, you know, the, the world has been shocked. And we've seen uh, Israel lose 40% uh, to 50% of its, uh, of its exports. Um, so it's really crippling Israel at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, boycott and divestment certainly has been doing a, a great job in wakening up the uh, Israeli uh, government and other countries as well uh, to the power of uh, people seeking justice. Business, 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 business